We heard all these stories about some babies that was being born in the northeast of Brazil that come with some kind of birth defects that related to microcephaly. And I thought it was very interesting, even for the name of the virus, that for Brazilian people it's a kind of a funny name because Zika here means something that's bad. So it's kind of a slam over here. By that time, we didn't know anything about Zika, you know. It was like a year ago. If you take a science, it's a short time for us to develop any kind of skills on that, you know. The virus circulating in Brazil was different from that one originally from Africa, you know, where all this history of Zika started, you know, in the Zika forest in Uganda. There's a 11 to 20 percent genomic difference between the virus isolated in Brazil and that one found in Africa. If you look for the prevalence of Zika in this population, for the pregnant woman, it's like 10 percent are Zika positive. But just like 3% of these Zika positives develops microcephaly during the pregnancy of the newborn. That's kind of weird because you can see the virus is not the direct cause of having a microcephaly because most of the women that actually are Zika positive, the newborns are okay without any neurological problems. So what is exactly the other factor so it can actually increase the neuropathogenesis of Zika? There's a lot of explanations, can be like related to the virus, maybe some pregnant woman has a higher susceptibility to develop microcephaly. Can also be co-infections with other virus, for example, we saw like chikungunya at the same prevalence of Zika in this population. Dengue is also another virus that circulates in these places. And there are some studies that show that usually when you are pre-exposed to dengue, before Zika, the pre-exposition to dengue actually increases the antibodies that can cross-react with Zika. And these antibodies actually increase the chance to get Zika. Uh, because the antibodies are not great enough to block the virus, because they are specific for dengue but not specific for Zika. When my son was born, which is seven years, seven years ago, he's seven now. And when he, when he was newborn, he came down with a mysterious high fever. So of course, being you know parents, you rush to the hospital. You're sitting in the emergency room, and the doctor sort of tell you, well, we don't know what it is, but we'll guess. And at that time, you know, day night, you're in the emergency room, and you know the frustration, the the, the helplessness, sort of got me have an epiphany. So really, that got me to thinking about, you know, I really want to develop assay so that no parent had to go through this. An assay is a complete reaction that detects whatever target that you're trying to detect. In a Zika assay, it has the, the PCR primers and probe, and of course all the other reagents that are necessary to amplify the DNTP buffer enzyme and such. So our Zika assay, it actually detects three viruses. The reason being that these viruses are carried by the same mosquito, Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya. I was playing around with developing a Dengue and Chikungunya assay, knowing that these two viruses are very important. So when Zika came along, we can quickly add that additional detection target. So 
this assay it's very important because combine the, the detection of the three vibes at the same time. Usually we must do this through PCR with specific primers and probes that is targeting each virus, Zika or dengue or something, one by one. The assay is very important because it also detects the viral load. Because we always saw when you have the higher concentrations of the virus in the amniotic fluid during the pregnancy, it's always associated to the more severe cases of microcephaly. The lower viral load, most of the babies, they don't have microcephaly. So in a traditional PCR, there's a number of reagent has to be added. If you pipette everything separately, you're looking at five, six, ten different pipetting steps. qPCR is quantitative PCR. It's using a fluorescent probe to detect PCR when it's amplifying. It gives a quantitative answer, which traditional PCR give you a yes or no answer. Our company makes a master mix so that all the reagent is combined into one reaction that's ready to run. All the user has to do is adding their sample, be it RNA or DNA. So how do you stabilize this complete reaction is we freeze dry it. So it's very much like a freeze dry food. All the moisture is pulled out and therefore it's stable at room temperature for many, many years. You can send to any part of the world that you don't have to worry about transporting giant styrofoam box full of dry ice that's not environmentally friendly. It saves the environment, it saves shipping costs, particularly the Quant Studio 5, which is cloud enabled so that user can monitor their results anywhere in the world. There are so many uh, questions, actually more questions than answers, about sick outbreak in Brazil. This is just the very beginning. The virus came to the south. Now it's in Sao Paulo, it's in Rio. Sometimes I'm a little afraid that I think it's going to be a disaster. Because over here we have the favelas, we have the people and more concentrations of people living together in the same place. So of course, more people, more mosquitoes during the summer increase the chance of transmission. Today, we don't hear anymore. Like, we don't see Zika news in the, in the television anymore. So people are forgetting about real life and these people are still dealing with their babies. They have microcephaly and they have problems to develop. So I'm, I'm just a little afraid uh, of people forget about one situation that's gonna happen again next year. So it's very important to invest, at least in my opinion, to public health in Brazil. Because we still have problems with so many basic things like general hospitals, access to the all public, or even education. We had the chance to get to know some of those impressive mothers. Some of them, they lost their children, you know, they lost their babies. This devastation, they were still able to think about science in the, for the sake of the other women in the next future. They decided to give the body of their babies to science, you know, for us. And this put us in another level of, uh, of uh, responsibility with the case. And of course, we're responsible for what we are doing, but you know, all the time when you go to the bench to work with the cerebellum or in the brains of the children after autopsy, you know, I look at them, you know, I'm there, focused on what I'm doing, but I still think, you know, there was a family <laughs> involved with that. If you look at the, the mortality rate children under five, that die of infectious disease. 99% of that, it's underdeveloped country. That's a huge, huge difference because the rest of the world, infectious disease, it's a big, big problem. We don't know what the next outbreak is gonna, gonna be. But I think, you know, as uh, Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. So we need to be prepared. So it's really our mission to make these technology available to the rest of the world, to give it to people that really need it.